registered to vote, even if they don't want to vote for a particular party, they can make sure that they, they have that, that set their say, and whoever they vote for, even if they are saying at least they're, they've got a voice as opposed to just being silent, because that, that doesn't do anything. Um, we as a student union are, uh, are not political, so we wouldn't, uh, we don't ever say you have to vote for a party, so we should vote for this party. We leave all our views aside, um, so we just encourage them to register to vote, um, and then obviously, hopefully, they, they turn that into actually voting. But whoever they vote for is completely up to them. But I think fundamentally, um, you see with things like the disabled student allowance was cut recently. Um, that was targeted for students. Um, a lot of the things are, tar are targeted at students because they're the ones who don't vote. So the government are technically uh, accountable to them. They are they're more accountable to the people who vote for them. I think that's their point of view. So hopefully, on the 7th of May, we see a lot more students in there. We know we've got thousands of students registered to vote. Um, the National Union of Students have made it their priority this year, and it's been fantastic. But it's no use if they don't turn out to vote. So hopefully, after May 7th, we see a stronger student presence more days like today where students are representing um, themselves and fighting for what we deserve. Hey, hey, I think Nick Clegg will be worried then. <laughs> <laughs> Ron and Ben go on. Stop you quick. We're going to go on to yeah. smart ticketing in a minute, so it might be better if we if we move on to that then. The card was, was uh, the ten years in, in, in actually development, and the back office for the Oyster card is significant. Plus, we carry the multimodal, is what we're looking to do. Is move to a multimodal use of tickets and a suite of tickets. You have to have that back office capacity. Gone. Well,
My ticket was about to launch on the 1st of May last year. It's a uh, ticket that you can buy on the bus, that's 160. Um, um, you can buy any, on any bus, and you can use it all day as many times as you want to. Uh, and any buses across the Mayor's side bar are probably going to have a lot of races. The tree will be for service, it's just the tree that I'm now going to have a lot of races to take the cars. Um, we've been getting data back on the sales of my ticket across the year, and it's grown steadily. It's averaging about 31,000 a week um, from about August last year and around 36,000 a week during school holiday time. So it's fair time, 31,000. So we're holiday time about 36,000. Um, the pilot was originally, originally uh, financial underweight plan there to travel went through and make remembers at £500,000 set aside for this. Um, what we've actually um, given back to your operators
So I think overall, just to say, is that my ticket has been, under Project 68 has been a success. There's no need for us to underwrite that element any longer. Um, the operators uh, want to carry on past the 12 pilot, pilot which is, is fantastic. Um, we need to look at the feasibility of extending the project towards the agency. Members, any question or comment? Yeah, thank you. The only things I'm going to say. John, sorry. Chair, I was just going to say for a £45,000 investment, if you do quick math, it's about £3.5 million market that we've identified with all the attendant benefits for young people and wider economy. Seems like a bargain to me, Chair. Yeah, and I think the only bit I was going to say is we said this was going to happen, and it has. And it's testament, actually, to the fact we've got it over the line, we've got it in. It's made the difference, and the next stage is to see how we can increase the age range. But really well done. It's a great achievement in less than a year in what we've been able to do. It's the first stage in that journey to improve things for young people. Okay, if we can agree that accordingly and move on to item 13. Okay. Um, and it's Liz and Gary giving us the update on Smart City.
it's a technology that makes it very difficult uh, to, to get things to work and get things right. It does introduce that level of security that we can rely on. That's something that's happening nationally. That is linked to the session of the last few years. So, Jim, do you want to add anything? Um, can I then move um, the recommendation in paragraph 2 of the report, if that's agreed? Agreed. Item 14 is the major event transport strategy that Wayne and Liz have presented for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of the paper is to advise members of a number of key measures that they've put in place to deliver a resilience in terms of the transport arrangements in support of um, future large events um, for the visitor economy and situation. Um, to kind of sort of put this in context, if you will, um, the, um, the city region with the uh, economy strategy for 2020 looks at um, growing the economy to 4.2 billion, um, supporting 55,000 jobs, um, getting the transport offer right that delivers a safe and practical um, set of arrangements that meets the demands of each of those events is absolutely vital. And not just because um, um, uh, the fact that we have to manage those visitors in the city, but also as a consequence of um, um, the reputational risk of getting involved with is also quite significant. Um, I think it's worthwhile also just identifying that um, these protocols relate to kind of large or ticket events within the city meetings as opposed to kind of the um, events that we've um, uh, become accustomed to being managed very well within the city region. So things like uh, the Open Golf and things like the entry event that we've seen in, in recent days, which saw um, 40,000 people using public transport, um, particularly on the network to get to. Um, better energy, which was very successful. Um, they're not within the scope of this of this um, set of arrangements. Um, in effect, what has been developed is a sort of a toolkit, if you will, of a number of arrangements that are uh, basically there's a transport strategy which was appended to the paper. There is a, a major events transport board uh, which has senior level um, um, ownership and participation, a strategic initiative register, 
um, a, a model, a, a spectator access model that allows us to understand um, what the demand levels are likely to be um, um, for any particular event. Uh, a transport coordination centre that is established on the day or the days of events that helps to coordinate and to communicate the events as they emerge in respect to the transport offer. Um, and also um, a, a, an integrated um, travel demand management communication solution as part of that TCC. Um, the, the major event transport strategy is looking at setting up what are the aims and objectives of the transport service provision and how that will be governed, uh, how it will be managed um, in terms of the, um, uh, the major events, and how what the whole kind of coordination, what the roles and responsibilities are, um, and what the accountability is are for each of the individual partners in that arrangement. Without going through all the kind of individual bits of the toolkit, there's two um, key things which I think are worth highlighting. Um, the first thing is, is the Major Event Transport Board. Um, that's a, a, a collection um, from the visitor economy, um, operators from both the rail industry and bus operators um, from the um, other agencies such as Blue Bank Responders, but also from the districts as well in respect of uh, representation on that board. Uh, and, and it's chaired by Mersey Travel with the intention that that group then, um, in advance of any event being identified, um, meets to look at um, consideration of planning, coordination, and then actual operation on the delivery of the event itself. Um, the next kind of area to highlight is the Transport Coordination Centre, which is um, a real time uh, coordination activity which should take place. It is um, uh, a forum by which, whether real or virtual, there will be some degree of co-location, there will be some degree of kind of virtual communication on the day of the event, linked to um, the normal joint agency arrangements that exist under the civil contingency provisions for this sort of event. So it will link into the kind of bronze, silver and gold command structure that already exists. Uh, and I think it's worth highlighting that the purpose of the, of the TCC is to provide that sort of common operating picture, the one version of the truth on the day of the race in respect of events uh, related to the transport activities as they emerge and to coordinate and to provide the information as things emerge and join the course of event to allow the best set of arrangements to be put in place to respond to those events. Um, the intention also is that um, we'll look at developing a series of contingency plans that will be uh, look at typical incidents and, and how they will actually uh, could be responded to and should they ever arise. So it reduces the amount of kind of having to do kind of ad hoc and reactive planning on the day of, on the, day of the race. What's not intended to do is to replace those other arrangements that just touched upon. So it's not taking any responsibility for direct operation control. It's not making the final decision on actions to be implemented by the individual control centers. And it's not at all taking any privacy for transport, safety, or security. Um, that's probably it in terms of the detail of the paper, but quite happy to take any questions or comments that might be. Members, any questions or comments? So I think it's a fantastic piece of work and, and really well done, something that um, hopefully will be able to put us best in class in terms of transport for major events. So if I can move the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Since 1915, low emissions vehicle. That is Stephen. This report seeks to uh, give a quick overview on the uh, rollouts of the uh, electric car charging process that we went from for 18 months ago um, and seek to, to uh, uh, approval for uh, the price structure to, to continue the scheme uh, for users. Also gives a quick update into the, uh, the work that's going on around auction vehicles with a plus the region. So then we just want to follow the commercial travel led to the city region bid from the 18 months ago and we're successful in securing the uh, specifically uh, office of motion vehicles. It's installed a number of car charging and uh, electric car charging in the specific region. Um, if uh, the scheme is split into publicly uh, available car charging uh, posts and uh, private uh, car charging posts, these are specifically for uh, local authority fleet vehicles. Um, so the public scheme which we named Recharge was launched last July at Seagull Ferry uh, and the first private posts went in actually at uh, the Odyssey and Sons Works Unit. Uh, so to date we have 12 currently installed, uh, 5 of which are public as part of the Recharge scheme. We have 10 on order awaiting uh, installation at present and we will aim to get another 12 before the end of June. So, 
charge elements of the scheme are public, publicly available posts. We uh, set aside an amount which was agreed uh, back uh, 18 months ago, £69,816, which was to fund the um, three years the ongoing maintenance, quality, and back office running of the posts. Uh, There's a cost associated with these posts. Um, and in the original proposal, we were looking to introduce um, charges for users from the first bit of this year. Now, this report um, outlines a few, a few of the options uh, to, to basically keep it free, to introduce, uh, introduce, introduce a, a one pound flat fee for users or a per kilowatt hour fee uh, for, uh, for users. Um, the recommendation is to uh, keep the scheme free for users until the 31st of March 2018. Now that's based on uh, several different reasons, but um, it, the money that the funding that was approved 18 months ago uh, for maintenance of back office, the host will be able to be free for that period of time within that budget, so we're not asking for any further money. Reasons for, for keeping it free, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's like that across the country really. Manchester introduced posts um, in the October 2013 and their posts are still free to use. They haven't graduated to any, any uh, charging for users yet. Um, the, uh, keeping it free kind of incentivizes use, you think, uh, in areas of the country which have introduced them, such as Dublin, they see a drop off in, in So we, we believe it's continue to incentivize, incentivize use of the scheme um, and the right thing to do. To date, um, posts that have been introduced uh, have been very well used. Um, Seacombe has had, since the end of March, 100, has been used 100 different occasions, which is, which is very encouraging. Um, and the posts that have been introduced this year have, have come to Thank you. 